It's a privilege to get to stand up here before you and deliver the word of God. I'm thankful, right? There's no opportunity. Anytime a shepherd of a house asks you, gives you the opportunity to speak, to sing, to minister to his flock, it's not something to be taken lightly. It means something. So I'm blessed and honored, just as the psalmist said, I was glad when they said to me, let's go into the house of the Lord. For those of you that will be turning in your Bibles, my, my title today is Don't Settle. Don't Settle. We're going to be starting in Matthew chapter 17, and I'm going to start with verse 1. So uh, you can go ahead and be turning in your Bibles there. As I was thinking and praying about what to deliver today, um, this, this word, this text just kept going over and over in my mind. This, this moment, many of you know it, many of you probably have most of it memorized. In Matthew chapter 17, we catch the disciples having a literal out-of-this-world moment. See, the disciples just a chapter before have proclaimed their faith that Jesus was not just a prophet. He was not just one of the other servants of God. He was not Elijah. He was not John the Baptist. He was different. He was the Messiah. And upon that confession in chapter 16, Jesus wants to take them on a journey. So how many of you are with me in Matthew chapter 17? It'll be up on the screens. Starting in verse 1. After six days, Jesus took Peter, James, and his brother John and led them up on a high mountain by themselves. He was transfigured in front of them, and his face shone like the sun. His clothes became as white as light. Suddenly, Moses and Elijah appeared, appeared to them, talking with him. Then Peter said to Jesus, Lord, it's good for us to be here. I will set up three shelters here, for here one for you one for Moses, and one for Elijah. While he was still speaking, suddenly a bright cloud covered them, and a voice from the cloud said, This is my beloved son, with whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. When the disciples heard this, they fell face down, and they were terrified. Jesus came up and touched them and said, Get up. Don't be afraid. When they looked up, they saw no one except Jesus Alone. How, can I preach for a moment? We're going to keep going. I'm going to stop right there. If, if you're in a moment, if you're in a moment in life and you don't know what else to do, but you can see Jesus, you're going to be all right. Yeah. Amen. If you're going through something you don't know how you're going to find your way out of, but you can still see Jesus, you're going to be okay. And ending that part right there, let me find, as they were coming down the mountain, Jesus commanded them, don't tell anyone about the vision until the Son of Man is raised from the dead. Let's pray. Father, Father, this is all about you. We've sang about it. We've talked about it. Nothing else matters. We're here for one purpose, that the work of Christ be glorified and magnified today in your house. So, Father, as we open up this book, as we open up your word, I ask that you would, you would allow me to get out of the way, that you would just use me as your mouthpiece. You would use me as a vessel just to articulate your love, your truth, and your purpose for your people, Father. Father, I ask this in the glorious and matchless name of Jesus. Amen. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do something a little unorthodox this morning. I'm going to give you guys up front right now in the first five minutes the main point of my sermon. In preaching class, they tell you this is an absolute no-no, but I'm going to do it anyways because you need to know this. Don't settle for good enough when God has promised everything for your good. Don't settle for good enough when God has promised everything for your good. Paul says in Romans, what? God is working everything for your good. Hallelujah. That's, that ought to make you shout about something. Everything. Even when I don't understand it, I'm going to preach this morning. Y'all don't, don't have to help me, I promise. He's working everything 
Not just the stuff I like, not just the stuff that I think benefits me, but even the hard stuff. He's working for my good. Even the stuff that's painful, he's working for my good. The biggest danger to your good is not bad. It is when we settle for good enough. It is a dangerous place to be. A dangerous way to live in the land of good enough. That's the American dream. Get a job that's good enough, pays enough. You can settle and, and get just enough vacation, just enough luxury, just enough. But we don't read about that in Scripture. We don't, we don't, that's not in God's vocabulary. He didn't make us for good enough. He made us for more, more than enough, more than we could ask or think. And up here on the mountain, the disciples are faced. They've already declared that Jesus is, is the Messiah. He's the Son of God, right? They've already said it out loud. And now Jesus kind of puts them in a situation where their actions have to live up to that confession. It says that they're up on a mountain and it's high. You've got to pay attention to mountains in the Bible. You've got to pay attention because every mountain is significant. Every mountain has importance. Why? Because that's where we go to meet with God. What's interesting to me of all the people, all the characters that could appear in Matthew 17, Moses and Elijah. What do we know about these guys? Well, the first thing that jumps out of my mind is these guys knew a thing or two about mountains. They knew a thing or two about what God does in the lives of his servants when they're willing to go up the mountain. You see, Moses went up a mountain called Sinai, and he was given the law, right? Actually, in chapter 33, he says he was, this is the second time he's given the law, because the first time he got mad on his way down and broke it, right? But what he didn't realize is what God gives us on the mountain has to get into the valley, he, he's coming down the mountain the first time and he has the tablets that, that he's carved and has the Ten Commandments. And he comes down and he sees what? He sees Israel given over into idolatry. And he gets mad and, he, and he, he has a tantrum, if I can use that word. And he just shatters it. That's how I imagine it happening. Just right, I know it was made of stone, but it just makes a better image in my head of just smacking it over the knee. But what? Why? They didn't know in the valley what he had known on the mountain. They didn't experience what God showed him on the mountain. You see, what, what jumps out to me, I'm getting ahead of myself. If I'm not careful, I'll, I'll preach right to my conclusion before I get through the rest. Who's, who else is up there? Elijah. Oh, man, does Elijah know something about a mountain? You see, it was on a mountain called Carmel when the prophets of Baal thought they would have a little contest on whose God was bigger. Whose God actually listened? Whose God was actually with them and for them? It was also on a mountain called Horeb when Elijah went up and got alone. And he said, the word of the Lord came to Elijah and said, What are you doing here, Elijah? What are you doing here? Go out of this cave. The goodness of God. The glory of God is about to pass. Now, most theologians, the reason I can't say all is because theologians are like dentists. You can only at best get nine out of ten to agree. Most theologians, they say that Mount Horeb and Mount Sinai, the ones that Elijah climbed up and the one that Moses climbed up, are actually the same mountain. And of course, we can't know this for sure, but many speculate that it might have possibly been the same cave, the same cleft in the rock, the one that Moses climbed up many generations earlier and witnessed the goodness of God. Can we just think about that for a second? This man witnessed the goodness of God in all of its entirety. Well, I can't say that. Actually, you know, God had to shield him because if he actually saw all of it, he wouldn't be able to handle it. How many are thankful God doesn't give us the whole vision. God doesn't show us everything because he knows we probably couldn't handle it. So he says, I'm going to let you see just enough of what you're ready for. And his goodness pass over him. Generations later, Elijah would climb up. He's, Elijah was going through some stuff. 
Can I give a little context? Right? Mount Carmel happens. He calls down fire. A little uh, spoiler alert. Elijah wins. Right? The Lord of Abraham and Isaac beats the prophets of Baal. Um, and, and actually, Elijah kind of makes a mockery of them. Right? He tells the prophets of Baal, you know, why, don't, why don't you call out to him again? Why don't you try again? Maybe he's asleep. Maybe he's on vacation. Maybe he should try. And so the prophets of Baal are losing their mind, right? And they're doing everything they know to do to get this, whatever you want to call it, to answer. And Elijah steps up and he goes, pour some more water on it. Pour some, pour some more. I don't want anybody to think there's some natural way other than the power of God that this could have happened. Pour some more water on it. And of course, he asked a simple prayer and God answers with fire. So these two men appear before Peter, James, and John on the mountain of transfiguration. And needless to say, by Peter's reaction, they don't know what to do. The Gospel of Luke actually says that, that it, it kind of paraphrases this. Whenever this comes out of Peter's mouth, it has an open parenthesis and says, he didn't know what he was saying. He was so afraid. He was so overwhelmed with what was happening in front of him that he didn't know what to say. And, and if you've ever been like me, I'll raise my own hand, and you get nervous, and you just foam at the mouth, and words just come out, and you go, that wasn't my best and shining moment. Peter finds himself in this place, and he's standing before Moses, who represents the law, the giver of the law. He's standing before Elijah, who's... The prophet of prophets. And he says something. Jesus, it's good that we stay here. Luke's, Luke chapter 9 actually records that it says that as Moses and Elijah were departing, Peter says, whoa, 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 whoa. We're good right here. We got Moses, we got Elijah, we got you, Jesus. Let's build a tent and just hang out right here, right? Because the disciples are facing some stuff too. Down in the valley, they've got Pharisees that are getting more and more agitated at what Jesus is saying. In the valley, they have multitudes of people that keep coming, wanting more and more. And the pressure of the valley is getting a little heavy. And so Jesus takes them up to the mountain and, and Moses and Elijah start to leave, and, and Peter says, probably just like us, whoa, let's not be hasty. Let's not rush, rush out of this. Let's, let's hang out right here. I'll be honest. You go to a good conference. You go to a good, a good revival, a good, a good service. There's something in you that's like, I think I'm just going to sit here. I'm just going to lay, because when I walk out those doors, there's a lot. I'm just going to hang out. So really, we make fun of Peter, right? Because if anybody's going to speak up and say something dumb, it's going to be Peter. But in all reality, I think Peter's a good rep representation of us in most of these stories. If we were face to face with the reality, the glory of God made manifest in the person of Jesus Christ, we were face to face with a man that talked with God, saw his goodness and another man, Elijah, we won't even get into all of Elijah's stuff. Just know, it was a bunch. We would be tempted to say, oh, man, I don't think I really want to go back to the valley. But remember, what happens on the mountain has to get to the valley. What happens in the mountain of our spiritual experiences has to get down into the valley of living. So we don't live on the mountains. I don't live on the mountains. We, get, we don't get to stay there. We visit the mountain. God imparts to us. He speaks to us. He shows us something on the mountain, but we don't live in the mountain. It's interesting to me that, that as he's speaking, the cloud comes. While Peter's still trying to get this argument out, of, hey, I think it's good that we're here, right? I used to read this text and think Peter was just talking about, hey, it's good that 
we're here, right? Just kind of making it about himself. But when I read this text, and you put it in context of he's then says, hey, let's build some tents. He's, he's, not talk, he's not making it about himself. He knows who the stars are, right? But he's saying, hey, let's, it's, it's good that we're here. Let's not, there, let's not go back to all that where Pharisees are out for our destruction. Let's not go back to that where, where people have more and more questions. Let's just stay here. And, but the, the, the text continues, uh, starting in verse 14. It says, When they reached the crowd, a man approached and knelt down before him. Lord, he said, Have mercy on my son, because he has seizures and suffers terribly. He often falls into the fire and often into the water. I brought him to your disciples, but they couldn't heal him. Jesus replied, You unbelieving and perverse generation. How long? Will I be with you? How long must I put up with you? Bring him here to me. Then Jesus rebuked the demon, and it came out of him. And from that moment, the boy was healed. Then the disciples approached Jesus privately and said, Why couldn't we drive it out? Because of your little faith, he told them. You ever love how Jesus just cuts to the point? Like, he doesn't really mince words. He just, why couldn't we do it? And we want, we want the, the man of God to kind of just sugarcoat it. Like, well, you know, you, have, you need some more life experience. You need some more, some more wisdom. You know, these things come with, no, you just don't have faith. For truly, I tell you, if you have faith the size of a mustard seed, you will tell this mountain, move from here to there, and it will be moved. Nothing will be impossible for you. Nothing will be impossible for you. They come down the mountain into the valley and the other nine disciples are struggling. The other nine, they are trying to do ministry apart from the mountain. They are trying and striving and doing everything they know to do. But when we try to live in the valley... And avoid the responsibility of the mountain. We're going to struggle. We're going to, it's going to be hard. And that's when the temptation is going to be, right? How many other disciples were probably tempted to say, well, I guess this, this kind of demon just doesn't come out. I guess, I guess we've done all we can do. I guess he's just going to have to live with this. Are you getting where I'm going? Are you here? Let me, let, me, let me say it a different way. When we're in the midst of the valley, that's when the enemy speaks. It's never going to change. It's never going to be different. Your family member is always going to struggle with this addiction, struggle with this, this habit, struggle with this depression, whatever it is. It's not, maybe it's you yourself. It's never going to change. Just settle. But Jesus comes off the mountain and the three disciples that would just experience this glorious revelation. And what they received on the mountain transformed what was happening in the valley. Don't settle for good enough when God has promised everything for your good. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to bring up one more passage of scripture here and then, then, then we're going to Get to my closing. That's only the first time I've said it. I've got two more. Um, for those of you turning in your Bibles, I'm going to be in Second Samuel chapter 5. I believe starting with verse 4. And David was 30 years old when he began his reign. He reigned 40 years in Hebron. He reigned over Judah seven years and six months. And in Jerusalem, he reigned 33 years over all of Israel and Judah. The king and his men marched to Jerusalem against the Jebusites who inhabited the land. Important to know, it was actually called Jebus uh, at the time of this writing. Uh, but the, Jerusalem was called Jebus. Uh, and so they, they, the Jebusites had said to David, you will never get in here. Even the blind and the lame can repel you. Thinking David can't get in here. Yet David did capture the stronghold of Zion, that is the city of David. He said that day, whoever attacks the Chibusites must go through the water shaft. Other translations, I like it, but it says the gutter. To reach the lame and the blind who are despised by David. For this reason it is said, the blind and the lame will never enter the house. I'm going to stop right there. 
David has a choice, a little context here. David's been reigning as king in the southern kingdom in Hebron for quite some time now. And it would be easy. He's faced his battles. He's won his victories. Nobody really questions whether David is enough. It would be easy to say, I'm good. I've done enough. But there was something in David's heart that knew the land that was promised to Abraham, that was promised to Isaac, that was promised to Jacob, was theirs. How do we know this? We know this has been in David's heart for a long time because in 1 Samuel chapter 17, right, the the major battle with David and Goliath, I won't tell you the story if you don't know it. um, Read the Bible. After David beats Goliath, he cuts off his head, pulls it with him, goes into his tent for a little bit, probably to clean up, Um, And it says, after that, he pulls the head, he takes the head of Goliath with him and puts it on a stick, on a spear outside of Jerusalem. But what's interesting to note, just as I told you a moment ago, it's not Jerusalem yet. It's still Jebus. What is he saying? David wasn't just a king, he was a prophet. And he was feeling things prophetically that God was wanting to do for Israel. And so after he defeats this Philistine heathen, He drags his head, this giant that that the rest of the world deemed undefeatable. You couldn't outmaneuver him. You couldn't outpower him. He was a giant. And so David, after defeating this giant that could not be defeated, takes his head with him and puts it on a spear outside of Jabus. What is he saying? This is what happens to the enemies of God who stands in the way of the promises for his people. And you're next. See, the Jebusites, they thought they couldn't be captured. They thought their walls could never be defeated. In fact, this this passage I just read that talks about the lame and the blind, that was them actually taunting the people of Israel. I read one uh, scholarly report that said that this is actually a reference to the Jebusites would put up caricatures, would put up like uh, fake lookalikes of their forefathers. And the lame and the blind actually represents, the lame represents Jacob. Said he wrestled with an angel and from then on he walked with a limp. The blind represents Isaac. We know that when he was in his old age and Jacob came for the blessing, the reason he got one pulled over on old Isaac because he was weak in the eyes. He couldn't really see. And so the Jebusites would use this term, the lame and the blind, and they would hoist figures of Isaac and Jacob to taunt them and say, this is where you come from. You think you can take us? This is what, this is, what are you thinking? They used psychological warfare, but it was a bluff. How many things is the enemy keeping you out of because of a bluff of insecurity? How many things the enemy is telling you can't have this? Look where you come from. Look where you came. Look, your, your father couldn't do it. Your grandfather couldn't do it. Their generation couldn't do it. What makes you think? We could put the lame and the blind up here and you still couldn't take it. And so David in 2 Samuel chapter 5, he comes and he, this prophetic longing in his heart to see Jerusalem reclaimed for the people of God. They come and and they say, hey, if we're going to do this, we're going to have to go through the gutter. About 20 inches wide, probably the same deep. And it says, and whoever goes up first, you're going to be in command. How many know, I wish we could give our kids everything. I wish we could give it to them on a silver platter. But some things worth getting only come when you go through the gutter. Some things only happen when God puts the promise in front of you in a gutter between you. And you've got to decide, am I going to go through the dirt? Am I going to go through the struggle? Am I going to wipe the mud and whatever else out of my eyes? Because God has given me a promise. Or am I going to settle? I could have settled, David could have probably thought. I could settle with Hebron, right? I'm a good king. I've defeated plenty of enemies. I've secured the southern kingdom. This is, I'm good. But David had this longing in his heart 
that good enough is not good with me. Good enough is not good for my family, my people. If God has promised us, he will deliver. Hallelujah, I feel the Holy Ghost. I'm going to preach a minute. This is obviously the biblical narrative of how Israel took over Jebus and reclaimed it as Jerusalem. But my thought is, what does this text mean to us today? Many of you, we could, I could pass this mic around and we could talk about the promises of God. The promises of what he's given you, of what he's told you is going to come to pass. But between you and it is a real big and stinky gutter. He said, your family's going to be delivered. Your family's going to be saved. God, I, I don't know if I want to go through all that because believing is hard. Believing is a fight. Believing is you take three steps forward and slip back two. Sometimes you take one step forward and slip back five, it feels like. But if we're going to get to the promise of what God has given us, it was already theirs. If we're going to get to it, sometimes it takes going through the gutter. Sometimes it takes going through the muck, going through stuff we'd probably rather avoid. And it says that when they came up out of the gutter, it was all a bluff. David didn't lose one man that day. Didn't even have to raise a sword because it was a bluff. Don't let the enemy keep you out because of a bluff. Because he, he thinks if he can wave your insecurities in front of you enough times, you'll just settle. If he can remind you what family you came from, you, you're not, God can't use you. Look what your granddaddy did. Look what, look what so-and-so did. What makes you think? It's a bluff. It's a bluff. Everybody say, it's a bluff. Look at your neighbor and say, I'm not settled. Look at your other neighbor and say, I can't stay here. Sorry, Tyler. We go back to, the reason I bring that up, let me, let me say this real quick and I'll, I'll get ready to close. That's the second time. In 1948, many of you should know this date, was the, was the year that Israel was reestablished as a nation. What many of you probably do not know is a little international plan called the Uganda Plan. The Uganda Plan was something made up by the United Nations that said, you know, yeah, we want Israel to have their own land. We'll give them 24,000 square miles in Uganda, and that can be theirs, right? But there was a man by the name of David Ben-Gurion, who was the first prime minister of Israel. If you ever go to Israel, you'll have to fly into a place called Tel Aviv, and you'll go into an airport that's named after David Ben-Gurion. Well, this, this man, he was 15, and he was giving speeches about something God had put in his heart to see Israel become a nation, to see the land God had given their forefathers restored back to them. And the UN presents this plan, this settlement, if you will. And the issue was that David's father, Herzl, liked this plan. He said, you know, they're never going to give us the holy land. We should just take what they're willing to give us. We should just settle here. But David began to give more speeches. And he said, I love my father. I respect my father. But why would I take plan B when God has promised plan A? He would give speeches to the UN and say, I know Uganda has rivers, but they don't have a Jordan River that God rolled back and said, walk. They may have mountains, but they don't have a Mount Carmel where God rained down fire to show that he is Lord and Lord alone. In fact, one of the debates, one of the conversations got so heated that one of the leaders in England uh, kind of said, you should just take, you should just be happy, right? It's 24,000 square miles. It's all yours. And young David, in more wisdom than I personally had at 15, looks at him and says, would you trade London for Paris? And the leader of England goes, heavens No. That's my best British accent right there. Heavens no. London was ours by the beginning of the, the British Empire. And David looks at him and says, and Jerusalem was ours when London was a swamp. Good enough is not good. 
the greatest enemy to what God has promised is when we settle in the land of good enough. Flipping back to Matthew 17, I promise this is my last major text of Scripture. That's the third time for those of you counting. Back on the Mount of Transfiguration, it says that what? That Elijah and Moses are standing here, and when the disciples look up after the cloud, it says they've disappeared. What is, what is the gospel trying to say? Moses representing the law, Elijah representing the prophets. It's tempting to settle. Moses represented what we can do for God. You understand, in Moses' time, people didn't have a relationship with God. God had a relationship with Moses. And the people just obeyed the commands. And many people haven't moved past Moses' theology. They think all my, all my relationship with God is, is I just, these do's and don'ts, and I just say, yes, sir. Elijah represents what? He was hope. He was hope to the people of Israel who were under a wicked king worshiping pagan gods. What does it mean when Elijah disappeared? That we're no longer hoping for a salvation to come. We now have the opportunity to live in a salvation that's here and now and in front of us. And I love what God says, right? The cloud disappears. Moses and Elijah are gone. And God says, this is my son. Listen to him. Don't listen to the, it was good. It was glorious. Moses' day did incredible things. Elijah's day did incredible things. But he is God and beside him there is no other. The law was pointing to him. The prophets were pointing to him. Listen to him. It's interesting in the gospel of Matthew at the very end, somebody comes up and asks Jesus, what's the greatest commandment? What they're really trying to say is, what sin do I not really need to not do? And the others are kind of more okay. What sin, what, what commandment is the greatest? And he says two things. He says, love the Lord God with all your heart and love your neighbor as yourself. Watch this. And on these two hangs all the law and all the prophets. And these two things. Love God enough to climb the mountain, enough to get alone with him, enough to get something from him and be able to love your neighbor as yourself, to go back into the valley when it hurts and it's hard and it's tiring. On these two things hang the law in the prophets. Caleb okay, Michaela, if y'all could go ahead and make your way back up here. I'm going to say this again because it's worth repeating. The greatest danger to your good is settling for good enough. David had a choice. Hebron's fine, but I've got a promise. In Jerusalem, he, it was no longer J. Buse. Once he climbed up that gutter, he got through, he broke through, they took over the land. It was no longer called J. Buse. It was called the city of God. Sometimes the place of Hallelujah. Sometimes the place of your biggest struggle, God will turn it around to be a reminder of your greatest victory. Sometimes the strongholds in our life, the strongholds in our family, that every time we look at, we're reminded of our weakness, we're reminded of where we come from, we're reminded of how impossible it might be. When we make the decision that we're not going to turn back from the promise and settle for good enough, that stronghold's going to come down. That mountain's going to move. But we have to have the ability to have faith, and faith requires what? Work. Ooh, that's a bad word. Faith requires risk. 
It requires stepping before there's anything under my feet to know I'm going to actually be okay. It, it requires believing when everything else points to the counter. Don't settle. If you hear anything else, don't settle. If God's given you a promise, I promise his bank account is big enough. That, that check's not going to bounce. He is faithful to the end. He is faithful with our hearts. He is good, not just good enough. If you'll begin to stand all over the room. mountains, if you've ever climbed them, what does altitude do? Typically, it gives you a different perspective. And the things that looked huge in the valley often look quite small when we're standing on the mountain. What is the mountain? Maybe it's your, your office in the mornings before everyone gets up. Maybe it's your car on the ride to work. Maybe it's your backyard at the break of dawn before the world starts moving. Make a, an intentional decision. I'm going to get to the mountain. And whatever God gives me, it's going to get to the valley. God's blessing isn't going to stop with me. It's going to get in me and through me. I want to give this opportunity for, for anyone in the room. First one is, is obviously for salvation. If you felt like you've been stuck in the Moses theology and you've been afraid to come to God because you don't feel like you can do enough, you don't feel like you, you have it all together, Jesus is here. He's new. He's better. It's no longer about what you do, but what he's done. Maybe you're stuck in Elijah thinking, well, I'll get saved one day. My salvation will come sometime. Jesus is better. That's the whole book of Hebrews, if I can sum it up. Jesus is better. He's not just good enough. He's good today, tomorrow, 10 years from now. If you have been wrestling with that decision, feeling like you can't come to the mountain, only, only those select few get to go up the mountain. Only the Moses types get to go up the mountain. He paints the picture that they were in a field. Why? Because the mountain that once separated the elect from the rest, now it's all level. With Jesus, everything was level. Everyone's on the same foot. Everyone's on the same even ground, desperate and needing of a Savior. 
So if that's you, I want to open these altars right now and give you the opportunity to make a decision that will change the rest of your life. If you're stuck in the valley and you've tried and tried and tried and nothing seems to be working, this is your invitation up to the